This video contains content sponsored by John Wilson Blades and MK Blades. Opinions discussed in this video do not reflect the views of John Wilson or MK. Well, Christine and Phil, we're here at the 2017 U.S. Figure Skating Championships. I guess start off by both of you talking about how many championships have you each been to? This is 32 for me. 32. My second one was Kansas City in 85, so I've come full circle several times. <laughs> and this is my 28th. Should I speak into the mic? Yeah. This is my 28th. <laughs> <laughs> Phil and I are close. Uh, I, I think people will be surprised to find out we're that close. Um, mm -hmm. My 28th in a row. Mm -hmm. Starting in 1990, I haven't missed one. So you've got me by a few. So you both cover a number of sports. When did you actually for both first meet each other? Oh, that's was a it, good question. Was there a baseball... I, I, you know, Olympic I can't festival? remember. I, I, it certainly was, it was certainly the Barcelona Olympics, the Seoul Olympics. How about a, LA in 84? Not me at LA in 84. You so weren't there? No, I was not there. So maybe in Calgary in 88? Definitely Calgary. Calgary. Yeah, that's, Th probably. that's probably it. We, we met over the Battle of the Carmens or the Battle of the Bryans, one or the other. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, although, although I didn't cover much baseball, so you, and by, you were covering a lot of baseball. By that time, I was not covering much besides Olympic sports, so, yeah, we covered, right. I, and you were, But you were in Baltimore, and I was in D.C. We may have met some at some point. Some before that, an yeah. ACC basketball game yeah. or something. Clearly, it was memorable. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've both written a lot about skating, the decline of interest in the sport, but you both choose to come back. So, I guess, what attracts you both for figure skating? What attracted you, and you know, what keeps you coming back year after year? Well, if I didn't come, I couldn't argue with Christine about stuff, so that's, that's a major attraction. <laughs> That's, that's got to be what you know, right? Top on your tops on your list. Yeah, I think. Well, I, I'm sure. We, I know I speak for us on this. You know, it's just a delight to cover. We know everybody so well. Um, the stories intrigue us. Uh, the fact that it's the athlete on the edge, it's the individual athlete having to perform. You know, hockey players, what? After two minutes, they take a break and leave. You can't in that long program. You can't take a break after two minutes and leave. Although, Although Victor Petrenko did at the '92 Olympics. <laughs> I, I said, uh, straight, straight to the person here. I set you up for that. Yeah, uh, we've seen we've seen that over the years. Nicole Bobek, I think, used to do that as well a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, it's. I think it's just. It, it's it's great fun. It's one of my favorite weeks of the year, without a doubt. What about you? Uh, I just like the you know. I got attracted to her originally because of the combination of music, art, and the unbelievable athletic skill that's involved. And that's kind of, you know, when, when you see somebody do it, doing it all together, and it's, un and it's gotten so hard now with the technical demands on them, you just say, wow. I mean, it, the, to be able to put that all together, to try to interpret something, and to do, you know, seven jumping passes in a long program, and now three and four or five soon quadruple jumps. It's an it's astonishing skill that's required, and sometimes you see it because there is the artistic and musical side to it. You see a performance that moves you on a level you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite little what six seven minute time periods in all of sports, and I'm going to sound like a total sequin head here, is that warm up period, the last warm up in the women's competition on the Saturday night. Uh, I felt the same way about Worlds or Olympics, but at the nationals, they all come out there. And whether it was Michelle and Sasha and Sarah in that era, um, you know, the Kimmy Meisner era, you know, whatever it was, and now with Ashley and, and Gracie and Mariah, that anticipation as you watch them come out on that clean ice, often clean, and do all their stuff for that warm-up period, uh, and knowing within, what, 30, 40 minutes, we'll know who the winner is, we'll know who the Olympic gold medalist is from that group of women next year, for example. I just love that. I love the anticipation, the moment, the, uh, the way it builds, and then, and then a result that, especially in women's figure skating, I know we've talked about this, you know, whether it's Peggy Fleming, Dorothy Hamill, Christy Yamaguchi, uh, on and on it goes. I mean, you're not just an Olympic gold medalist. You have won the most, one of the most lucrative and most famous Olympic gold medals you can win, and you will forever be known as the woman who won the Olympic gold medal in figure skating, which is a pretty cool, cool thing. When did you both realize that the personalities in skating were a little bit different from other sports and a little bit intriguing. Well, I've told this story several times. Um, at the 1980 Olympics, when compulsory figures was still part of the Olympics, um, I spent a lot of time talking to people watching compulsory figures and because everybody, and I realized that people in the sport just loved to talk. 
they like to talk about the sport, they like to talk about the personalities in the sport. And that was, Viktor Kovalev was the reigning world champion at that point, and he withdrew at the last minute, and everybody knew why he withdrew. It had nothing to do with any kind of injury. And they started telling Kovalev party stories. And I said, wow, this, you know, not only are there stories here, but the people are willing to tell you about all of them. And um, I've often given great credit, deserved credit, to Carlo Fassi for, for being unbelievably patient with me and teaching me about the sport. Um, and Carlo, of course, knew where all the bodies were buried, and he buried some of them himself, I'm sure. <laughs> but, and I go back, really, to, I started covering in 90, but 92, that Olympic trials, where we had Christopher Bowman, we had Paul Wiley, the 92, the women's competition was unbelievable with Christy, Nancy, uh, Tanya. And um, it, I remember talking in the press room, where we, by the way, had about 50 or 60 newspaper reporters, that what an amazing tableau this was, whether it's the judges, the costume controversies, the parents, you had Christopher Bowman doing what he was doing. I mean, the stuff that was going on was extraordinary. I thought then this would make a great book. And I remember actually telling Lynn Plage in the press room, this would make a great book. And I had just finished a book with Tracy Austin, uh, uh, you know, her, uh, as ghostwriting, uh, you know, it was told to me. And so I was in, I was in no, time, no mood or, or I didn't have the time to actually start actually writing this book. But it, was, it hit me then, and I think one of the things that I know we feel about someone like Brian Boitano, who we both adore, is that, um, you know, I think Brian said this years ago, early on they learned as, as kids, teenagers, that life was not fair. The judges, you know, they'd skate great and the judges would hammer them because of the costume or this or that deduction or whatever. And so I think they, they were older uh, and wise beyond their years earlier, and so they could laugh at themselves. Uh, there was a sense of this kind of whimsical, like, can you believe we're in this sport? And I, I, as we've gotten to know these people as adults, whether it be Christian Magucci or Michelle Kwan or Brian Botano or Scott Hamilton, uh, we found them to, I think, even be more delightful just because they went through that school of hard knocks at a young age and came out all the better for it. The other thing I think is that because it's an in totally individual sport, even in the events where there are couples skating, it's not a team sport. You never have to subsume your your personality because it might ruffle the feathers of your teammates. They're a lot more likely to, to let who they are come out. Um, either it comes out in their skating or it comes out in the way they behave off the ice. And, you know, there's just been some great personalities. I mean, the thing about uh, the sport that people don't understand, I mean, it looks like this very rich kids, elite kids sport. And almost all the great champions have been from uh, either blue collar or solidly middle class backgrounds and and um, so it you know it it, um, it plays against type in a lot of ways uh, what, what's interesting you, you talked about Brian and Christy and and Michelle and um, now Sasha Cohen I've watched a lot of these uh, more the three uh, women because I, I, Brian was already in the sport by the time I started I watched them grow up from like 12 to become now uh, adults and with some, some of them with families and I've just been so impressed by the way some of these people have handled themselves after skating as I've said to Michelle several times what you've done since you've finished skating is more impressive to me than the unbelievable record you had as a skater and I think Sasha Cohen now is going the same way Tim Gable also with a degree from Columbia going the same way I mean Sarah Hughes. I mean and Brian know. who has made up Brian, Brian who's, who's remade himself two or three times I mean so doing the house remodeling, getting interested in his Italian roots, becoming a great chef, um, and still at age 50, whatever he is now, uh, an extraordinary show skater. I mean, it's really remarkable. They're, they're, they were great athletes, and, and a lot of them have become really interesting people. And, and you know, as they've matured and their interests have broadened, their new interests are as fascinating as what made them champions in skating. And, you know, a shout out to Michelle Kwan. You mentioned her. You know, um, she worked with Hillary Clinton's campaign at a very high level. And I, I know we've both been in touch with her, and you know it, this has not been an easy you know, since we're speaking on the night of the inauguration. Uh, not been an easy time for her, or for many people, many of us, and, and the nation. Um, I, I wrote, I think it was in '06, when in, in Torino, when she uh, had to bow out and leave the, the Olympics in Turin, Torino. Um, I wrote that Michelle has lived her life as if a child has been watching her, um, and I really, I mean, I guess if Michelle goes and robs a bank. I, I know we'll probably be both pretty shocked, and I, I'm saying obviously being facetious there, but uh, that Michelle Kwan, man, she's pretty impressive. Well, that's what, the same thing occurred in, um, in Nagano after she lost. The way that she accepted that um, was, you know, and much more, I mean, Salt Lake City, 
maybe her time was was passed. I mean, ninety eight looked like the. Peak well, she could have won won it, but but, but ninety eight yeah. looked like the absolute peak of her career, and she had lost. She lost a very very close competition, and she handled it with a grace, and a calm, and an acceptance that was really unbelievable. I mean, she mm -hmm. won more. Um, the late Mike Penner of the Los Angeles Times wrote a beautiful column up on that very subject, saying that basically saying Michelle had won more fans by the way she handled what happened than than she would have had she won the gold. And I think most people, if you go on this, if we walked out right now out of this arena and asked ten people name an Olympic gold medalist, I think the most names we'll get we would get would be Michelle Kwan, and of course mm -hmm. she she did not win an Olympic gold medal. And I think from that moment on, you mark time. In the way she handled herself in terms of whether it's endorsements, not that that was on her mind, but we, how many zillions of times have we covered NFL games and, and Major League Baseball games where you've got some 35-year-old athlete who gets to play in six weeks or you know six months, who's throwing his helmet against the locker, you know, pitching a fit, furious. They're going to get paid every week and they're going to play again, and you know, and, the, and you'll have the Super and Bowl. Michelle's got four years to wait right. to get another shot. Su this. Super Bowl's 52 uh, weeks before they play. You know, that's I mean. <clears throat> relatively soon. Michelle's got four years and maybe never. And the way she handled that as a kid. Also, and we don't, not that we, although I'm sure your, your viewers, Dave, don't mind uh, talking about, listening about Michelle, uh, stories about Michelle Kwan. Consider this, if the Olympics don't go, go off kilter, if you don't take the Winter Games and move them to 94, and I'm glad they did. I, mean, I think that was a good move. I, I know you and I, I'm sure we we'll agree on that. But if you go 92 and then you go 96, that's when Michelle Kwan was at her absolute peak. Yeah, I mean, and that would have been the gold medal probably for sure for Michelle in 96, had there been a Winter Olympics in 96. Because uh, I, I, I will contend for the rest of my life that as amazing as what she did at the Nationals in Philadelphia was, that the Salome at, in Edmonton in 96 was the highlight of her career. I mean, sure. It was particularly because um, and when we saw her skate that program at Skate America early in the year, she looked like a 12-year-old kid. Now, I understand Salome was a 12-year-old figure <laughs> in the Bible, but she looked so callow and immature, and by the time she got to Edmonton, she was a transformed person uh, choreographically, she was transformed interpretively, and you know, the moment that you know, I was got, which I just think I described is, uh, I said it was as if um, uh, Lou Chen had, had come down and hit a three-pointer to go ahead by one mm -hmm. point, and Michelle came down at the other end and did a reverse 360 dunk to win. Mm -hmm. When she added that triple toe loop, at the very, I mean, it was in the back of her mind if she needed it, but she, you know, but like four seconds to go, she adds a triple toe loop, which at that point was still, a, you know, a, a jump that was considered difficult, mm -hmm. and that's what she won with. It was a, a you know, it, it was amazing. That, but that was one of those things where you saw two such great skaters, mm -hmm. and, excuse me, at the same moment. You know, Lou blows the doors off the building, and then Michelle blows the doors off the building and six buildings next to it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the juxtaposition, because Michelle Kwan came after Nicole Bobek and Tanya Harding. So when did each of you realize that those two personalities in the sport were unique personalities? And when did you start keeping an ear towards Portland and what was going on there? Well, Tanya, the moment we, we first heard about her, I mean, she was around in the late 80s and early 90s, but 91, we covered the Nationals, where she landed that triple axle right in front of us, the first time a U.S. woman had ever done that, and uh, announced her, her you know, appearance on the, on the international stage in a very big way. And then went to Worlds and repeated the performance, even though she didn't win, she was right. that good again. Right, and of course that shows what Tanya could do when she wasn't smoking, you know, the adjectives involving Tanya, chain smoking, asthmatic, and then of course the live-in ex-husband, Jeff Gilluli. Um, but, you know, Tanya, if, if she trained, she was great, and, and, and still one of the very few U.S. women to ever do a triple axle. So, that's 91. Um, we also, of course, read the stories and heard the stories and started to report ourselves about Tanya's life back in Portland. The, the, the anecdote I will never forget, Phil, was where she was in a little altercation with, uh, with motorists in an intersection and she grabbed a baseball bat out of the back of her car and she threatened a motorist with a baseball but bat. But that, that was post the Nancy Kerrigan wax. No, it wasn't. wasn't it? I believe that was in 96. Um, really? But I, all I remember no, is that for a certain no, number of world championships after 94, Tanya would make some bizarre news. She was being harassed, stalked kidnapped. by golfers. Hmm. Um, well, she, she got kidnapped had, she, by a golf, a bushy haired man. And then, and then she Maybe had the thing with bushy. the baseball bat. And then there was, you know, it became a running joke of, you know, we get to Worlds and, the, and if three days had gone past without Tanya making some police blotter type news. Wow, what, what's going wrong? Tanya must be ill. <laughs> um, so, but in terms yeah. of, of no, what knowing something weird was going on, I mean, you know, there's the 
the famous joke that, uh, and uh, my memory of it, what you think said Mark McDonald, and my memory of it was that Steve Woodward said it, but within minutes of the of the hearing that something had happened to Nancy, somebody said, where is Tanya? Yeah. Where, what do you think happened to the lace in 94? Oh. Oh, you mean oh. with, the, with the broken lace? Yes. What is your theory on that? That she broke it herself? Is that what you're trying to insinuate? I, I'm not insinuating that. <laughs> I have one of the broken he, laces. He actually has the lace, yeah. Um. Yeah, I, well, we used to joke that Tanya would have a string somewhere and her dress would partially fall off if she missed the line. That was, that was 93 worlds. Right, right? <laughs> that was it, right. And, you know, Katerina Witt's dress would occasionally pop off and, you know, not that anyone is presuming anything, uh, any nefarious uh, activities there. But uh, Tanya, because of the nonsense, and, and also... There was the more basic stuff, like having a, her coach, Doty Teachman, and getting rid of Doty, and of course flying so late to Alberville that she had jet lag, even though she said she didn't have jet lag, well, she had jet lag, so she was flying from Portland to the French Alps, and uh, you arrived, what, two or three days before the competition. And then the, the ovarian cyst on the way to the airport for the competition in Norway right before the, what, the 94, it was, 90, it was 93. It was, right, it was for the 93. test event. Exactly. So, but then, so she can't go, but she she withdraws too late, so that the U.S. cannot send a replacement. You know what I mean? And she, then, she, the, which which uh, which nationals did she qualify for after she after she got a buy because she claimed that she ninety four death, threat, death threat death threat, which who knows now if she had called in the death threat or you know. I mean, I mean, it's hard to keep the years straight with Tanya because it was something you know. Listen to this. It was going on. I mean, we're just talking about one person here, and uh, but yeah, I think we all started to. Well, again, it was a joke in the press room that day, January 6, 1994. You know, did, where was Tanya? Did she do this? And then we go through the next few days at the Nationals. Nancy you know, has a press conference. Uh, we watch Tanya win the, the national title. Of course, that is then vacated later, a few months later. Um, and then, I don't, I don't know, I went, I went back to D.C. I'm sure you went back to Chicago. And a couple of days later, I, I woke up to all news radio saying the FBI was investigating Jeff, Gil or interviewing Jeff Gooley uh, to see if he had any involvement in the attack on Nancy Kerrigan. I sat up straight in a bed and I said, oh my God, <laughs> we are in for the ride of yeah, our that lives. Consumed, that literally consumed my life from that moment, from the moment that it, it became known that somebody close to Tanya was involved, not from the moment of the whack. Um, from that moment until the day that she uh, announced that she was withdrawing from Worlds and it reached a plea, a bargain agreement, and you know, and had reached an agreement with U.S. figure skating. Because I remember that distinctly that year, I was going to Hawaii on vacation that March, and be, if she was going to Worlds, I was going to Worlds. And that was back in the day when the airlines would still do you favors, and they rewrote my, my Chicago, Hawaii, Tokyo, Hawaii, Chicago ticket like three different times without charging me for it, <laughs> all, the, all of which was due, due to Tanya. Um, but, you know, nothing, I mean, that was, everything you wrote, even the punctuation marks, was read by people. Uh, and it was so, on A1. I mean, we were day after day on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. I was at the Washington Post, New York Times, leading the network news day after day. You know, I was doing tons of TV. You were on TV. It was, people could not get enough of this. And I know most of the people who follow you, Dave, and follow uh, all of your videos know this already. But you, uh, you cannot overstate how that, that moment was. We're watching the Paris Shore program. Uh, in 96, or 94, excuse me, on January 6, 1994, and what it led to. And I think one of the key elements of that story, which you saw a little bit with Ryan Lochte, nowhere near as important, and it, but maybe is idiotic in some ways, but uh, in Rio, was that this story just kept building. You had something it was going towards, and that was, of course, the short program, which is the sixth highest rated show in television history to this day, will always be, um, based on uh, this story building all the way through January into the end of February. Well, one point I'd like to make is that a lot of people assumed that that was the beginning of, the, of figure skating as, as something that people watched. That could not be further from the truth. Katerina and Debbie, the final 20 minutes of that free skate at Calgary, drew ratings in the 40s. And you know those numbers to anybody today, you, they sound like that's their misprint, right? And then you know, well, going back to the post, you know, Sonia Henney, who created that post World War II generation, including Barbara Ann Scott, and then Tenley, and then uh, Carol, and then on to Peggy, and then on to Dorothy, and etc. Figure skating was a big deal before that. What what? It was the, by far the highest rated show on the in Olympic telecast. Christy Yamaguchi, with that time difference, that that free skate got a 29 rating. Think about it. I mean, 29 rating today. People on television would say, if we get a 29 rating, we'll die and go to heaven tomorrow. So, yes, Tanya and Nancy created this big artificial blip that pushed it to levels 
that it hadn't seen before, but it was starting from a pretty high level to begin with, although only in the Olympic year. What the good thing about Tanya and Nancy, or Tanya, as Brian and a number of people have said, we all should be sending uh, Tanya Christmas cards every year because she made a lot of us very wealthy with all the shows and the contracts and the, and the stuff that followed. And, you know, even including Michelle Kwan, who made a lot of contractual money from U.S. figure skating over all those years, and then you know, made a ton of money on Tommy Collins's tours. So I mean. Tanya, but what happened was because the bubble then got to such an enormous size, when it started to leak air, it looked the drop, look, the shrinkage looks worse today than it really was. Well, in ninety, but, but well, even now though, figure skating, I mean, most of the of the, the sports in the Olympics, summer and winter, would kill for what figure skating has. A network contract. Uh, Saturday night, you know, this this the women's competition here will be shown Saturday night. Uh, yeah, but this is know. being shown wall to wall on, on NBC and its networks. Yeah, which, it, it's, uh, it, even swimming, which obviously you can make the cases is as is, is popular a sport as there is, Olympic sport, you know, with Katie Ledecky, with Michael Phelps, etc. Um, swimming would kill to have this kind of coverage all year round. Yeah, they don't get this for their non Olympic no. year competition. So even skating at this low point compared to where it is, it's still in rarefied air. And uh, yes, we've talked about the you know arenas not being full. Let's also give give credit where it's due. In Boston, the world, where we were, of course, just a few months ago. Uh, that was incredible. That was like 96 with, uh, you know, in 98 and with, with Michelle and, and even the, and, the, in Philadelphia. The 2014, was the Nationals free, women's free skate and the Nationals got a big, big crowd, mm -hmm. I think a near sellout crowd. And for a moment, you felt like you felt transported back in the days mm -hmm. Well, I mean, basically, for a period of time, the women's free skate sold out at almost every national sport, no matter where it was, even in places that had very little to do with figure skating, like Atlanta and Dallas. Well, speaking of 2014, where do Ashley and Gracie compare for you in the personalities that you've covered? And, you know, let's talk a little about their stories here as we go into the free skate. You know, what are your feelings about how Ashley will do and how Gracie will do? Well, you know, I'll, I'll, you know Gracie better than I do. I'll, I'll certainly start with Ashley, who, who I know from the D.C. era, way back when. From Washington, um, Ashley, I, I think is is remarkable in that she has gotten so much out of talent that we might not have thought would be worthy of what three national titles and a world silver medal, um, and Grand Prix finals and, and other uh, you know assorted titles and, and and achievements. I mean, she works so hard and she has done so much with uh, with the hard work. I think it's extraordinary. I also think. Um, she is as quotable as any skater of her generation, and potentially any generation. And I, I know I say it, and I'll say it again, because what that woman did, what Ashley Wagner did, speaking up at that Olympic summit, saying, it was unbelievable. saying we, I've got to talk Everybody about this. Everybody else was ducking, running and ducking and, and We're going talking about the Putin anti-gay law. And she said, wait a minute, I've got to say something about this. And then, unlike basically anyone at that point who would then go, okay, whoa, I, I was out there too much, she kept at it. Every time we asked her in Boston at the, at the uh, Olympic trials, of course, where she had the bad performance was put on the Olympic team, she continued. She in never Sochi. backed down. So we get to Sochi. There's about five of us around her. and We I noticed said, that there are rainbow colors right, in the rink. But it was, here we are on Russian soil now, right? And, and now there's this risk because Putin, you know, this idea of what's, what's going to happen with, uh, with our, our friend Putin. And, and she just continues. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of rainbows around here. And she kept it up. Um, it's a profile in courage that should be noted. I've said it before on your videos, I'll say it again, remarkable. And just a class act, the way she talked about Trump, the way she's talked about everything, even her comments about, um, about Karen Chen and about how I'll be dead soon or I'll be dead someday, so we need young women like Karen. Come, keep it up, Karen. Come on, Karen. I mean, she's just a, a, she's masterful in terms of talking, a delight, super smart, she's, and one of my favorite skaters I've ever covered. We, we looked at a lot in the short program, the, one of the biggest differences between she, Ashley and Gracie, forgetting that what they achieved technically, was Ashley's an actor, born actress out there. Her facial expressions are incredibly dramatic. You know, you're you're a long way from the people in the top row of the balcony, and even with these nice jumbotrons, if you if you choose to watch that instead of look down on the ice, it's very hard to fill an arena. Only rare people can do that, and Ashley helps herself do that because she's so ex physically expressive. And Gracie went through that whole short program as if um, she dropped a mask over her face. Gracie has been like that since I first met her um, in, in 2011, uh, the, the, when she had had the really good junior competition in um, uh, Lithuania, I forget exactly where it was, and she all of a sudden, there was this huge buzz about her, 
um, she was on the one hand very open to me talking about her lack of confidence, but at that, sometime right after that, a switch went off, and she wouldn't reveal anything about herself at all. And then in Sochi, uh, actually, I remember it was Jury Longman of the New York Times and Amy Grosswater and I were sitting and uh, standing on talking to Gracie afterwards, and all of a sudden, Gracie opens up completely, and, and um, she said basically that she was tired of being thought of as a cardboard cutout. And I figured, well, you know, maybe you know she feels really comfortable in her skin, and she's going to go on from this. And and we know that uh, she did have, you know, she's had some ups and downs, but she had a very after the stupid blip in the short program where she just popped a lot. She came back with a great free skate. She had the great short program at Worlds um, and took over first place. And then when she imploded in the free skate. I've never seen somebody as hard on herself as Gracie Gold was. Apologize. I mean, it was like we all talk, We all remember we didn't witness it, but when Midori Ito came back from the Olympics uh, to Japan after winning only a silver medal, she apologized to the country. Well, Gracie Gold apologized to the country and and you know ba and basically said, "I'm ashamed of myself." And it seemed to me the whole season, this whole season after that, that she couldn't shake as she start went into the season and started to train that she could not shake the mental devastation of what had happened by that bad skate in Boston. And, and I think that that's affected her all season. I talked to both of her coaches, Alex Urshef, her old coach, who she went back to for a couple of weeks of jump tune-up, and, and to Frank, and both of them said that she has not really been in the best of shape this year. And, you know, that, that seemed to me, you know, maybe it, it took her longer to get herself back into that grind. And, you know, you know anybody... Christine mentioned hockey shifts, which are actually less than, more like 40 seconds than two <laughs> minutes. I mean, to get yourself in a shape to do four minutes of that at full speed is incredibly hard. Even if you were doing nothing but skating, let's, let's forget the jumping passes and the spins and the footwork sequences. So I think that uh, Gracie's had this horrible hangover, mm -hmm. and now I think she's skating with the, with the um, weight of the world on her shoulders. Someone who watched her practice today said she had a very, very bad break. You know, talking about Gracie, there's a blankness there. You, we're, we're close to the ice here, and, and really, we, normally we're up in a press tribune somewhere. We're so close to the ice, and it's alarming to see her face. It's, it's troubling. It, it's, uh, uh, fr frankly, you know, she's a mess. And as journalists, you know, we, we write stuff, and we talk about things, and we kind of almost are detached. But I really started to get worried about her when we were at Skate America, which, which you missed, even though we're in your hometown. When she had, as I'm sure many of the, the, uh, the viewers uh, and, your, and your followers were well aware, I actually ended up writing about this, that she was this, this concern about her weight and the way she was talking about herself. All of a sudden we were, as journalists, saying, no, no, Grace, you look great. Because you started to watch someone kind of crumble before your eyes. Uh, that was in the midst of all of the trouble she's been having, and it's continued. And to see her out there, it's not just the missing the jumps. It's that this, this beautiful skater is no longer a beautiful skater. She looks so scared or so, there's so something about her that there's a blankness. Her personality is almost gone. And I would say we actually saw the judges do something we rarely see with someone of her caliber. Now, they still, the component scores were still pretty good, low eights, and there was one high seven if you looked at the, uh, the average of all, all of them. But well below Ashley, Ashley was in the high eights. So Gracie was well below Ashley, and normally you'll see in a situation like that, where they'll, they'll bring the components. They'll bail around a little bit, they'll bail around. Right. And they did a little, because frankly, I'm not so, I think that was pretty high. But what we're seeing here is I, I think the judges, and you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in the long program, of course, Saturday. we have no idea, we're talking before that. But uh, those of us who've covered a few of these things, I, I'm, I'm alarmed for Gracie personally. Journalistically, as I, I look at it, I feel like the judges are saying, you know, this has been a terrible year for you, and we're not necessarily going to give you any gifts. Fascinatingly, Gracie did speak to us after, and she was great, by the way. Her quotes are almost as good as Ashley. She's she's remarkable and she's and, and forthcoming, and I, I give her all the credit in the world. Which is interesting because she's Ashley. not forthcoming at all on the, on the ice. ice. Never, and she, her whole career has basically been that. You're way. right. She should she's take not that forthcoming at all. Take that person and go on the ice with it. Ashley, of course, is the same. Ashley, what you see on the ice, that uh, that just grabbing life and going for it, is exactly what Ashley Wagner is. Which is why it works so well for her. And why she's such an engaging person, and why so many of us like her so much. But Gracie, it's the exact opposite, but it, it is, it's, it's 
really come to the point where it's almost like the judges were saying, you know what, Gracie, you know, we're, you're not going to get a you gift. Get your act, when you get your act back together, together, we'll give you the scores you deserve. Right. And Gracie then was asked, well, what about Worlds? And she said, I think they should put me on the World team. That's very interesting that she said that because I was surprised that she was that forthcoming on that particular topic. I think when we saw Gracie at Skate America, it's easy to be observers. Total respect for Gracie and her family. I could be completely wrong here, Phil. But I think when we saw her at Skate America, there was a part of me that said she should take the rest of the year off. Now, if she blows the doors off the arena tomorrow night, it'd be great to see, and I'll take it all back, <laughs> and never mind. But I really am wondering if this wouldn't have been a better situation for her to take the rest of the year off, especially if she has trouble in the law program. What was interesting to me is that she goes out in that short program and does that opening combination beautifully. Yeah. And, um, and then she said she was slow. I th we all thought she looked terribly tentative going into the flip. And it's like, the, you know, instead of saying to yourself, she's got, well, she nailed that tough combination, this is going to be great, and the back of your mind is always, which of the next two jumping passes is she going to screw up? Yep. I mean, it's always, like you're, you're expecting always. a mistake now as, as opposed to expecting her to go through the program powerfully, the way she did in Boston in 2014, the way she did in St. Paul last year. Um, it's really, you know, she's been an interesting skater because, and purse, and a young woman growing up into adulthood now at 21, she even, two or three years ago when she would do telephone media teleconferences, it was like talking to a Stepford wife. And now, over the last year, she's gotten so much more comfortable with giving a little bit of herself in this in this very weird environment. You're talking to all these reporters, but you're talking over a telephone, you can't see anybody. And she was, you know, obviously what she said at Worlds, after the disaster in the free skate was stunning, which, which what she said after the short program last night, she was very honest. So there's like this, it's... You almost want to say to her, Gracie, let down your hair out there on the ice, too. Let, so, us, let us see some of who you are. So what has happened, it's a, just kind of throwing it out there, what has happened that she can't? Because you're right. I asked that question about what happened, and it, you timed it out. Her answer on that conference call you were referring to a few weeks ago, four minutes. Try that at home, for, folks. Four minutes of talking. That's unbelievable. Straight. And that, that great line, grow up, Gracie. And she's given herself this incredible talking to with all of us listening. And then on the ice, she is, it's just, it's really tough to watch. I'm sure people who love her, her family, it's really devastating to see this. Journalists, as journalists, we're, it's, I, I've never seen a skater go, who's so good, who's got such talent, Phil, uh, have such trouble for such an extended period of time. Carolina Costner is the only, is the only one I can think of. Um, who's, who, yeah, but who Carolina. Could, who could go from the, world champion level and Olympic bronze medalist level to not landing a single jump in the Olympics is or, or, or coming close to that. So what, what, what drives you? The, so what, Gracie's what sort of never drives, done what Carolina, Gracie has none of that yet. She no, has she's no not world, got the medals yet, but, but she's medal. always had that talent, the talent oh, to do that. Doubt, I mean, sure. which you see with Gracie and, and you know the joke about the perfect name and the Hollywood look and, and as Frank Carroll once said to me, yeah, all that is wonderful, but she's got to do it out on the, I mean, things will fall into her lap, and, you know, the rain will fall, money will rain down on her, but the fact is that she has to be able to be a champion on the ice. Um, and, and she has won U.S. championships, but she hasn't been able to take that to the next level. You know, I think that if she has a bad free skate or even, let's, you know, you know, anything less than acceptable. If it's mediocre or bad, I think she's moving back to Chicago by the 1st of February. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, and of course, meanwhile, you've got Ashley, who isn't really the underdog, because she's the reigning world silver medalist, breaking that long drought, uh, and three-time national titleist, and in a perfect position, frankly, third place, just two points behind Karen Chen. And as she said, she loves you know being the underdog. She's not the underdog, really. But she, she now it can be third. So Ashley's in a great position. You sense that she's just going to skate you know, very well, make the world team uh, with, I mean, again, who knows? <laughs> we'll see. Let us know but if that, we're right or not. Right now, to me, I'm almost interested to see what happens with Karen Chen. Yeah. Because two years ago in Greensboro, after what she did in the free skate, we figured, wow, she's the next one. I mean, she's, we don't know whether she's going to be the next one in terms of Olympic gold medalist next one, but she clearly, you know, at that point, you had Paulina, who was coming off the Olympics, and then Karen with that great free skate, uh, and Paulina, of course, last year at, at Nationals, uh, before she got hurt, skated even better. It looked as if, and, but by that point, Karen was already going down. 
So it looked like you did, you were going to eventually have the successors to Ashley and Gracie, who have dominated this sport in the U.S. since 2012, uh, the two of them. They've been in a, up, up there far above everybody else, even if somebody has snuck in with a result in between. And then Karen had all sorts of things go wrong. I mean, there's constant, I don't quite understand how an athlete who depends so much on her equipment can have so many problems with skates and boots, but the, she did, and they caused injuries, and she was one bad performance after another bad performance. And, and if you look at the individual results you're thinking she's you know she's never going to get there and what she did in the short program I, absolutely none of us expected it it was so completely out of left field and it was great I mean not only I mean she choreographs the program herself she by the end of it she has actually taken on I often said in the Olympics in the short program in 94 Oksana Bayul actually was a swan um, well so was was uh, Karen by the end of that program when she got through the jumping passes she was totally enveloped in the in that you know uh, personification of this animal that, that she was uh, this bird that she was playing and it, if she could come up with a really good free skate and you know really good good enough to be second or third overall I mean it could be the, the a resurrection of her career well I and, spoke yep. to a number of past champions I wanted to ask you a couple of past champions, they all said unanimously they're rooting for Mariah Nagasu. And I wonder, you saw her in 2007 when she and Caroline Zhang came on the scene, winning the next year in 2008. You talk about a resurgence of a career with the last year or so. What do you make of her chances for tomorrow night? Oh, I think she's got a good chance. Uh, she, she's First of all, the way she's talking, and we you know again the conference call where she's talking all about college, she's got more than just skating in her life, which I think everyone can agree if there's something else there that you can focus on. The other thing that doesn't have to take quite as much uh, of the, of your, doesn't suck the oxygen out of your life, and you've got something else to, to just take your mind off skating. Um, Mariah, amazingly, is only 23. She's been around forever. She's two years younger than Ashley. Um, and they're, by the way, both sick of talking about how old they are, but it's remarkable, the staying power. Uh, Mariah, 2008 national champion, fourth in the Olympics in 2010. Here we are in 2017. She's on her, what, second or third comeback, and it's terrific. She's on her 11th comeback. What's interesting about this comeback, though, is the comeback that I see from her is so far more a psychological comeback than something manifested by results, because her Grand Prix results were not good. I mean, she was third in Nationals last year, did very well. So she hasn't had a consistent string of results to reflect how, how I think comfortable she is in her own skin now. And I mean, you know, we're human. We're reporters, and we try to keep very distant from the people we cover, in a sense, because you, do, you know, what Christine was joking about Michelle robbing a bank. You don't want to ever be in a position where that something like that happens, and you can't write that story because you're too close to the athlete. But that doesn't mean that we're not human beings, and that we can't like somebody, and that we can't feel good to see Mariah, after all she's gone through, seeming like a happy, self-confident engaged interesting young woman and I think that that will hopefully maybe tomorrow night it will carry over into um, uh, into the performance on the ice I, I, everybody it's impossible not to root for her. I mean whether you know a certain number of people thought she got hosed at the 2014 national championships I will always believe that under the rules in place that they made the, absolutely the correct decision Mariah was the unfortunate loser by the way those rules were structured but in She's become more also really incredibly popular with audiences. I mean, when she was at her best, she was not as popular with audiences as she is now. I think people appreciate all of the angst that she has had to deal with and all of the ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. Uh, and throughout, you know, so yeah, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not surprised to hear what you said that people won't like to see her do well because it's impossible to root against Mariah Nagasu. Well, it's going to be fascinating because you've got both of these skaters a generation apart or two generations apart in skating, Mariah and Chen. And we have no idea what to expect. I think with Ashley Wagner, we are pretty sure we're going to see a solid performance and she's going to make the world team. I mean, that would be my guess. I think Ashley actually could win tomorrow. I think she will win. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is set up beautifully for Ashley Wagner. So if we're in the, in the guessing business... However, I'll I picked Courtney Hicks for second, so uh, <laughs> don't take anything I say with, with so, too much... So uh, I, I, I think Ashley wins, and you think Ashley wins. Can Mariah, you know, she, Mariah's a very smart person as well, and, and, and Chen, now the, the key question for both of them, for Karen Chen and, and Mariah Nagasu, is 
you're sleeping on this for 48 hours and you're really thinking about this and you're and we saw what happened with Gracie when she had all those expectations in Boston different that's worlds it's not nationals but there's that same kind of feeling with each individual athlete here we're talking about what's at stake can Mariah rise to the occasion not make mistakes if she if she makes one or two mistakes and if Gracie somehow can nail this and and look good they're going to move Gracie into the top three, my guess is going to be. The question will become is if you have really three strong skates, Phil, with, with Ashley, with, uh, with Karen Chen, and with Mirai, and then Gracie's also right there, and I'll bet you they do not put Gracie on the world team unless she really earns it. Well, I mean, the, the, with the criteria in place, I mean, she certainly gets points for being fourth at Worlds for last year, but her season, this season, has been so horrible that that has to hurt her. I, I think I made a mistake earlier when I said Mariah was third last year. Mariah actually inherited the Worlds place because mm -hmm. Polina was hurt and couldn't go. And I know Mariah wants to get back. She said that she would like to get that. She loves wearing her World jacket because she hadn't been since 2010. The previous time she could have gone in 2008, she was too young to go for Senior Worlds. I think if, if she would have finish in the top three as she did in Boston in 2014 so you've now got three and fourth and third in consecutive years all of a sudden you're seeing maybe she's back to a, a level where she's going to be able to be uh, make that 2018 Olympic team I, I mean I think if she would have made the 2018 Olympic team the, I can't think that there'd be anybody who wouldn't be really pleased for her well I'm sure we'll be watching tomorrow night and want to thank you both and I'm sure we'll be talking later thanks so much Phil and Christine thanks Dave thanks, thank Dave. you